Hey everyone, it's a dose of Dr. Drew. It sure is, and we're going to get right into it with our guest today. We have limited time with him. It is Dr. Jay Bhattacharya. Uh, we have uh, fans of yours on my restream, and they piled right in here. Andrew Ashkazvili, thank you for uh, calling my attention to the interview that Z Dog did with Dr. Jay. Um, everyone, we're just using acronyms and first names, and, and uh, it's our, it's our, it's we're going to be a rap group one of these days. That's all. So I doubt it. Um, <laughs> But uh, let's just get right into it. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. J, just so I can gloat. He's a professor of medicine at Stanford. He's a research associate at the National Bureau of Economics Research, senior fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, and at the Stanford Fremont Spoli Institute. Uh, research uh, focuses on economics of healthcare around the world, particular emphasis on well-being of vulnerable populations, which um, God knows we have created those. Let's start with that. Uh, collateral damage. Uh, we have... Uh, how how did the public health community not do some sort of risk reward analysis as they 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 streamed steamed headlong into a policy that you would never find in any infectious disease or epidemiology textbook that has ever been published? How about that for an open question? I mean, I am still baffled. I mean, the the very first thought I had when I heard about lockdowns was this collateral. Maybe it's because I'm I've been have some econ economics training. Um, but I mean, when I looked at that, I thought, okay, well, you're going to stop people from getting cancer screening. Well, mm -hmm. what's that going to mean? It's going to mean mm -hmm. people, women with stage four breast cancer coming in that should have been caught last year, mm -hmm. right? If you're going to stop, uh, uh, you're going to stop people from getting diabetes management. Well, what does that mean? Kidney failures are going to go up. I mean, you, you, you get all these like range of outcomes that are so obvious and predictable from these kinds of policies. You, you, you Put people in their home and force them to just to sort of not not engage in their normal activities. Well, what are you going to get? You're going to get depression. One, you know, one in four young adults last year seriously considered suicide in the United States. Uh, internationally, it's even worse. You stop doing uh, TB treatments in clinics in in India. What are you going to get? You get hundreds of thousands of of TB patients that uh, that are going to die from TB or worse or or or, and, or spread the disease even further. Um, nutrition problems are, are all around the world as a consequence of the economic harm. Uh, I mean, all of these things were like predictable and they came to pass and they should have been at the forefront of our thinking when we were thinking about lockdowns to begin with. And, and yet not even a passing nod to these issues. I, I, you know, I worked 30 years in a psychiatric hospital. And so I, I knew the, the overdoses, the opiate use, this alcoholism would go up. And as you said, the depression, just when we announced on Twitter that I'd be interviewing you, a young person immediately, I just wrote it down because I just glanced at my Twitter and she said, we talk about young people's feelings of depression and doom. I mean, this is what we've done to an entire generation, not to mention the sociocognitive developmental arrest. Uh, I, I don't know of any better way to induce social phobia. I've said this before than to, tell people during their critical period of social development to stop relating to other people, go into a hole, be afraid of other people, wear a mask if you are around anybody and keep your distance. And if you go anywhere near them, you're going to kill your grandmother. It's like, what? And, 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 but I, I don't know if you were working during the AIDS epidemic, but I was very active in that epidemic. And, and, I, and I watched us develop, and I was part of it, why I got on the radio was to help developing health messaging, which we got very good at creating narratives and, you know, relatable sources and teaching people about the consequences of their actions and using humor and music and, and getting people to buy in to changing their behaviors. We didn't say this is a disease with, at the time, 100% fatality rate. We didn't say you're a murderer if you have sex with somebody. My God, no. No, I mean, I, so I was in training during the the, the latter half, the latter end of the. In fact, I was, uh, in fact, I was, uh, I was in training when the new, you know, the heart drugs came out in, I think it was 1995, and I watched the hospitals that were filled with dying AIDS patients drain away with yeah. the magic drugs. It was yeah. fantastic yep. kind of medical student. But I remember the lessons from it. Like one was, you don't stigmatize disease. You do not make people feel guilty because they have a disease, you give them compassion, you give them treatment as best you can. You, 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 I mean, that's our obligation in medicine is to provide that kind of compassionate care, not to make people guilty. And like, what's the first question people get asked if they, if they have COVID, well, where'd you get it? Where'd well, you, get you, it? Weren't you, weren't you being safe? I mean, it's, it's exactly, well, exactly. It's very, very similar mistake to what was made in the AIDS, AIDS epidemic, I think. Um, and uh, we've moralized behaviors that I didn't even realize were moralizable. If you wear a mask, you're a good person, I guess. I mean, it's it's such ridiculous nonsense. Instead of 
giving people advice, good advice about how to protect themselves the best they can, who's really vulnerable, what are your risks, giving them good advice about uh, all of those things so that they can make good decisions in their own life about how to, how to manage that risk. We scared people. We decided that panic was the right policy. The only thing that was important was to make sure everyone took the disease incredibly seriously, even if it harmed their life in other ways. Why? Why do you think we did that? Because I, I, that was the thing that I found shocking, and that's how I got myself in trouble. I kept, I started early pushing back on the press, saying, just shut up, shut up, shut up, because I saw them within a week of Wuhan outbreak literally saying all governments must adopt the policy of Secretary General Xi. I mean, that's what they were saying. Like, we need to have, you know, the, the street sweep and the lockdowns and things that were unheard of. It, it looked to me so strange. I, when I was looking at it at the beginning, I was thinking, are they really doing this? Or why are they, are they hiding something? What are they doing? Why are they doing this? Or is this some sort of exercise they've had and they're ready to do this because of the Wuhan laboratory? I couldn't figure it out, but I wanted the press to shut up while the CDC figured out what they wanted to do. But the press seemed to move ahead of everybody. Do you agree that's what happened? I mean, I think the press did, but I, I think it's, I, I do think that there was some element of the, 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 the scenes that were coming out of Wuhan and then Italy state, you know, completely cemented it in people's yeah. minds yeah. of an absolutely horrific disease with, a, and then World Health Organization says it's 3.4% case fatality rate, with it, which they conflated with infection fatality rate. With it, um, well, if you have a disease that's going to kill 3.4 percent you just do the math if everyone in the in the country gets it that's 10 million people dead and you're like oh my god 10 million people well and to be fair and to be fair that then then there, there's a piece of this that i'm willing to sort of like ease up on which is when things when it was the fog of war last spring and it wasn't all that clear lockdown sort of like okay you know let's all be good citizens let's follow our leaders they want to do this let's they may have some information we don't have let's let's do this but then to keep it going in spite of the cumulative damage that was developing for while other states were, particularly other states were opening with clearly no adverse consequence, that was hard for me to understand. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the central fact, uh, which was evident even in, from the Chinese data, was is this incredible age gradient in mortality risk. Yeah. So, so people who are older have a, almost a thousandfold greater risk of dying from this than kids do. More kids died last year from the flu, where we have a good vaccine, um, than, than the COVID. And the flu disappeared at the second half of last year. The kids are not susceptible in a, or to, to the severe outcomes is a really important fact. So you sh what we should have done is said, okay, who's vulnerable? Well, it's older people. Mm -hmm. Let's protect the old. We Instead, we thought that the at the early days, we thought, okay, the, the constraint is hospital beds. So we took patients who were COVID infected out of hospital beds to open up hospital beds and send them back to co uh, nursing homes. The, the key constraint was protection of the vulnerable. Yes, that should have been, should have yeah. been the key constraint, but it, but it was not. It was, it, it's going. It's you know, it's an equal up. It it it's some sort of weird. I don't know. I I, I felt a weird. Well, there there were so many weird. I don't want. I almost don't want to call it out, but it felt like there were weird political winds blowing, like. Equal. Everyone's equal with this disease. Everyone's the same, except certain populations, they get it worse, and we have to protect them. Not yeah. that the elderly in that population are the ones really getting blasted. And, and, and there were things that were happening here in Los Angeles, for instance. Like the African-American community did pretty well. They didn't get as much COVID. They had, they had a higher case fatality rate, and then we needed to understand that. But the Hispanic community just got absolutely obliterated, and no one was really talking about it. Well, I mean, the lockdowns didn't protect them, right? So California has followed this lockdown policy with incredibly unequal results. And for the Hispanic population, three times in LA County, literally three times the death rate from COVID per capita than no, the, no, uh, in whites. Nobody um, reported that. Nobody reported that. They, they would they would make it sound like we were doing poor with the African-American community where, we, where there was an issue, but it wasn't bad. It was terrible for Hispanics. I mean, it was really, really bad. Like and the lockdowns are luxury of the rich. If you are rich, you can afford to like, like sit in an office like right. mine, and I don't have to expose myself to the disease. But if, if you aren't, you have to go work at your at at, at in, in your job, or you can't feed your family. I mean, it just we didn't think about how unequal this was. And actually, you know, it's funny. It's Florida opened up, right? Florida opened up in May, and September fully mm -hmm. opened up last mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. There's not a race difference in outcomes in Florida for COVID. It's California that's locked down where you see this incredibly unequal set of results. 
So uh, if, lockdowns are racist here, guys. You heard it here first. I'll say it. I, you, Dr. J won't say it, but I'll say it. Because um, they, because I, that's what it felt like to me. It felt like it was there was a disproportionate burden in a certain group, and and no one was actually talking about where the burden fell. Uh, anyway, that's just me. Um, so, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Susan. Susan has a little strike back uh, thing here when I get angry. Um, but but someone asked us uh, on our my uh, chat stream here. No, I'm not. I'm not really striking back yet. I'm, I'm going to wait till Dr. J leaves me, and then I'll start striking back. Um, define lockdown. Let's let's. Shall we define what we're talking about there? I guess. Sure. Um, so that's a really good question, and of course, it has all kinds of manifestations. But it's a very very simple concept in my mind. Any policy designed to separate humans from each other, right? So mm -hmm. turn. Oh, I can't see where my fingers are. I hear you. Uh, you I see two, you. You have two people uh, apart. And a policy that is aimed at de diminishing social interactions in any way, shape, or form, I would call a lockdown. Yeah. That yeah. is the goal. It's, it's to minimize our contact with one another so that we don't spread. We are each just bags of germs spreading diseases to each other. That's the model. Yeah. And a lockdown is to reduce the amount of contact so that bags of germs can't spread germs to each other. What should have been the policy? What would that have looked like? Well, I mean, I, I have some, like, uh, I wrote the Great Barrington Declaration to articulate it, but it's not actually new. The idea is very simple. You, you protect the vulnerable. Mm -hmm. You identify them and protect them. And for the rest of the population, you disrupt society as little as possible. And I've and heard that, 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 that distancing without lockdown is actually a more efficacious intervention, significant, significantly. Well, it's, you want distancing, efficacious distancing. So what yeah. you want is yeah. people who are likely to be sick, not exposed to people who are very vulnerable. That's right. that's the distancing you want. So like what you want is policies to protect nursing homes, right? That that 40% of the deaths in nursing homes. You want policies that give paid sick leave to older workers or some reasonable accommodation. So they don't, you know, a Costco clerk, you're 60, 60, you shouldn't have to be exposed to the virus. Mm -hmm. uh, you should have some sort of some sort of mechanism so you don't have to like choose between your work and, and, and the virus if you're, if you're that age. Um, if you're living in a multi-generational home, uh, you should be able to, uh, you know, like we used hotels to house homeless. Why not offer that up temporarily mm -hmm. for older people living in multi-generational homes so that they don't have to, if, you know, some 19-year-old in their house comes in, says, oh, I might have gotten exposed, they have a place to go for the night or a few nights. Um, you know, actually, I said that on a, on a CNN show. Oh, that's and a good idea. I like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's not. I mean, these are not like complicated ideas and they're not, no. uh, they're not even new. I mean, I don't even understand why they were controversial. I, when I, when I, when I propose these, the, like these kinds of ideas, I thought the public health community would join because I'm, I mean, I do public health, but I, I know I don't have the monopoly on good ideas for how to like protect vulnerable people. That's what public health is supposed to do for supposed a Supposed to do. I, I, when, when, when they, you know, I, we're going to talk in a minute about something I heard from someone today that you, you, uh, um, gave him this idea and, and he I talked about another idea too which was this idea that uh when the public health officials particularly in california locked down beaches and parks that's when you knew that they didn't know what they were doing that that's when you knew for sure because it was there was no tr outdoor transmission in china we hadn't done the research here yet but there was clear data from china and and they were saying things like you can go to the beach but you have to stand up and you can't lie down i mean what what the <laughs> hell I mean, remember that? And and then they were, was, oh my God. I saw, I remember this chase of this this guy that was like paddle boating in the, uh, out, right. out by the Santa Monica Pier or something. Yep. And like, yep. what, like, how is this infection control? There was, the, there was something just wrong. Well, I, I actually, I was in Laguna during all that. It was just such a, it was like a nuclear you winter. You could go to the beach, but you had to stand up. Yeah, you, you couldn't, couldn't lie down. On a towel. But before you couldn't even go on the beach. And I remember talking to the lifeguards who were the ones having to enforce this. Like, did you ever imagine this would be your job? You're going to have people arrested for stay, walking onto the sand. Yeah. <laughs> we what should have I been encouraging funny, people to stay out there. I was there. taking somebody to get their vaccine, my housekeeper, mm. before I was able to get it. And there was a guy riding a bike with a mask on around the Rose, around Dodger Stadium, like or whatever that Elysian Park area, area is, by himself with a mask on. And I was like, the guy can't breathe. He doesn't need it right now. Like, what the <laughs> hell did they make him do? Like, I don't understand how we're able to get people to do this. I can't. I can't understand. Yeah, and then and then after you got the vaccine, you you still need to wear two masks, right? I mean, and and it's public health officials, Dr. Fauci telling this message, if you want to undercut demand for the vaccine, I don't know of a better way. 
Right. In other words, you get you get no benefit from, from being no benefit from being vaccinated except for risk of feeling sick. <laughs> that's your that's your that's your only benefit. Yeah, it's weird, right? You should be giving people. I mean, you know, so much of this has been an assault on freedom. It's weird. It's weird, weird, weird to me. It's, oh no, not yet. No, 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 Susan, please. But but it's just so strange that a country like this would be the one to fall victim to to an assault on one of the basic principles upon this place was uh, established. But all right, so so uh, let's go back to the vaccine for a section. A second, how do you think we're doing with uh, the immunity in this country? I think actually we're doing quite well. I mean, I think the the key thing is it's actually not even herd immunity. The key thing is still focus protection. So, and we've done quite well with that actually. We use the vaccine in service of focus protection. We, especially like Florida, is a good example. It's like they they uh, the, the they prioritized older people by by the end of January, every single person living in a nursing home in Florida has had had, had the vaccine or at least offered to them for the first dose. Um, I mean, California is a little slower, but still uh, we, we, we sort of caught up. Uh, so I think like 85% of, of all of the people in the US have had the vaccine, at least the first dose and 70% are fully vaccinated. That's fantastic. In, in the risk groups, not, not overall. Risk. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, and of course there is stupidity still abounds, right? I mean, oh my God. So we're going to go to Europe in a couple of months. I have, I, I have, I'm monitoring my antibody profile for multiple viral antigens. And I'm off. I'm way up in the sky, above average uh, vaccine level. But I have to take the vaccine because they won't. I won't let, let me on an airplane unless I have the vaccine. Okay, that's number one. No, I, that's. I mean, this this denial of natural immunity has been yeah. infuriating. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, okay. So my estimate is some somewhere on the order of between probably a half the U.S. population has had some COVID infection. You can kind of tell by you know, 600,000 deaths. The serology data say it's like roughly 0.4 percent more infection infection fatality rate in the U.S. because we've had a lot of our older population infected. Worldwide, it's like 0.2. So let's say 0.4, 600,000 divided by 0.4. That's about 150 million people um, have had infection. And we vaccinated, I think, uh, over half our population. If I'm not, if but, I'm not but remember, a lot of people who are in the post post infectious state are getting the vaccine also. Yes, it's not so like two different populations. So and let's, a third let's of the population of is kids. They're, and they they're don't requiring get it. it to go. They're requiring it to go back to work. They're requiring it for everything. So everyone, everyone who's had COVID is getting the vaccine. Yeah, for kids, I really don't understand the logic for kids. The ki- the kids have almost zero risk of bad outcomes from this disease. Doctor J, we've scared the crap out of kids. They are afraid to go out now. If they get the vaccine, they can feel free. You know, it's not, it doesn't make sense. I know sense. of some families where the kids are demanding the vaccine and the parents won't take it. It's it child abuse. I mean, like I said, the, <laughs> I like we yeah. shouldn't be scaring kids of, over a disease that they don't, and, it's, and we shouldn't be making them feel guilty about exposing parents to the, to the virus. That We've done it. You have, you have no idea. I don't, you must not be seeing the eight to 15 year old group very much because they are just apoplectic. No, they, I, well, I have a, I have a 16 or 14 year olds, uh, sons, and I've, I've made absolutely sure to let them know if they get me sick, I'm not, it's not their fault. Yeah, right. right. Can't, Good. Just, I think not. my son got you sick. <laughs> Maybe. It's fine. Whatever. He wouldn't get the immune test. Well, whatever. He was too it's, it's, look, here's the deal. Like, this is okay. the part that, that there's a, there's a reality piece in here that I don't understand why we can't get across to people either, which is that pandemics suck. Yeah. This is a bad illness. It sucks. Now, we start from there. It sucked that I got sick. I was sick for three months. It sucked. Yeah, it's, it, it, nothing good about it. But there's a lot of diseases I could get that suck too. You know what I mean? It's like this is this is part of being biological. In fact, I have some sucky diseases, and and, and I, that's the way it goes. Uh, we do the best we can with them, and we 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 soldier on. But this, I, it again, I just the, the mag. You know, it's funny. You before the mics heated up, you said something about. I think we were talking about the AIDS epidemic I, and that how certain generations of physicians reacted differently to this thing. I have to get um, a little bit of radiation therapy for something. And I was talking to a radiation therapist who was in medical school with me. And he, and we were started talking about the AIDS epidemic and the chief resident was in the room with us. And he was like, yeah, they, they've never seen, a, you know, they've never <laughs> seen a real illness like that, like AIDS. They, they just haven't seen it. They uh, And we had to kind of describe to him what it was like to see a Burkitt's lymphoma tear somebody's body in half. And, oh. That and to tell weird. somebody a pneumocystis they had four months to live, and you know, you know, they, they've never done anything like that. And he said the younger staff and the younger and the residents were the ones that had real difficulty contextualizing this illness. Isn't that interesting? 
I mean, that is interesting. Yeah. It, AIDS was a terrible, terrible, I mean, it is a terrible, terrible disease. Yeah. Thank God there's treatments. But like before that, it was. Oh, it's heartbreaking. You know, like, oh. Yeah. Hospital filled with dying AIDS patients. It's, I thought that was what my career was going to look like yeah. until the drugs came along. So, so, so to, what happened to our profession? What, what, why, why did we freeze? Why did we get so, um, I, I, I have my own theory about wh why we couldn't have discourse the way we normally do. Uh, what happened? It was really shocking, actually, to me, that that particular problem, like this this issue of, of free uh, exchange of ideas on a, on a novel disease, right? Of course, we don't know what the right thing to do is because it's new and we have to, we should have like free discussion. Instead, we sort of froze ourselves on one one narrative. And if you oppose the narrative, that I mean, you're, you're dangerous. Uh, right. So like, and, and really, there's like two norms. Right. So one norm uh, of, of scientific discussion, scientific discussion has to be completely freewheeling. If I have an idea and uh, the data prove me right, it doesn't matter who I am. I mean, it could be the, the you know, a, a nobody in the middle of nowhere. And I still I'm right because the but, data. But, but the, right. the, the discipline is that of. I, I discourse is too kind a of word, right? It, it's sort of assault of one another, you know, one of our ideas to try to refine them and and and, and come up against them. To because if they're going to become theory, they they we got to be sure they're right. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I and I do the other norm is public health, right? So public health, there has to be some unanimity. Smoking is bad, right, Doctor Drew? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's smoke. I mean, agreed. It's case, agreed. It's, although, although. Public health has gone down some strange paths where they start talking about third-hand smoke and third-hand smoke causing 2,700 adenocarcinomas. Like, what? Where'd that data okay. come from? Right. So, but actually, you touched on exactly the right thing. The moral basis for the unanimity of messaging in public health is good scientific evidence. See, so, yeah, right, right. The, mor the moral authority comes from good science, yeah. Right, but I, I think they're skipping over the good science part That's a lot of the problem. time. Like, okay, so I'll give you an example. Like, I, I did this seroprevalence study in Santa Clara and Alley County early in the epidemic. We find 40 or 50 times more infections than cases. That means that infection fatality rate is something like 0.2, not, point, not 3.4 mm -hmm. that the case fatality rate was, right? So that's, that's a big finding. We find, it in, we find it this in April of last year. Mm. I've never gotten more like crap in my life. I mean, from academics who were convinced that I was like out to kill somebody because I did a study. It's really, really weird. It was really, I mean, I'm still don't, I'm still processing how that happened, but I, I think a lot of it is just uh, once you've adopted this fearful posture and then, you know, doctors are as, as susceptible to as anybody. Um, it's hard to get yourself out of it. Well, and I've noticed, uh, you know, I've done a lot of work on the, the narcissistic phenomenology of the last 30 years, and it feels like for some reason, I don't know if it's because of the circumstance or what, but we've shifted into histrionic. Now there's a histrionic posture that, that the predominant characterological functioning is at the level of histrionic disorder, where everything is drama, I'm at the center of everything, everything is hysterical, De actual delusional thinking on a certain level. I mean, there's there's some delusional stuff going on that people kind of fade in and out of. That that's that is not okay. That's not okay. That that is not how we get to a good place. Yeah, I mean, and and and, and on top of that, you pile the sort of partisanship aspect of it, right? There's well, like it seems to be where it came from somehow. Somehow that figured into because yeah, I you know a lot of the stuff that, that California did wrong. They did wrong because it was the non-Trump move. Because Trump said do something else, so they went to the other end of the boat, and that was. Yeah. If you remember, California wasn't going to give out the vaccine because it was the Trump vaccine. Do you remember that? <laughs> I do remember that. And I, and I, yeah, and they were going to have their own panel. He put together some ragtag panel. What happened to that panel? That vaccine panel. What happened to him? you? Were you on that panel? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, it's it's unbelievable, uh, and it's because basic. because. That administration had something to do with the generation of the vaccine. Therefore, no vaccine. Well, I mean, I, I think uh, so. You know, Trump says HCQ is 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 good, and all of a sudden HCQ is, is poison, right? I mean, I right. I still don't know the answer to to like do these do these like small molecules do anything? I, why don't we have a whole bunch of big studies funded by the NIAID to give me give me an answer? So people ask me. Does ivermectin work? I mean, I just don't. I just don't know. I mean, there's, we don't I, have the data. All we have is data on people who are really sick, where it never should be used. 
Yeah, I <laughs> we, just, do, I just, we don't have data on the early and the old. There's some. There's some on hydroxychloroquine. It's not looking good. It's not looking particularly. Yeah, good. no, I've seen the I've seen yeah. the the, 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 the yeah. uh, meta analysis. But it's certainly yeah. not looking bad. I mean, it's not it doesn't hurt anybody. Listen, I it's I, I you know I was doing my uh, medical board reviews. Uh, I do the MKSAP on a regular basis, and and uh, I was doing the rheumatology uh, segment. And they were talking about hydroxychloroquine as first line drug for lupus and blah 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 blah. And they is they recommended that people when they get pregnant stay on hydroxychloroquine. It's the only medication that's the only medication I know that routinely it's recommended to stay on during pregnancy because it's so safe. Yeah, well, that's I mean, I've, I've been on it. I was uh, when I was a uh, medical student. I went uh, went abroad. And, sure. Uh, this is, I, mean, I think I think it's it's a very strange thing. Like. We, we obviously can conduct large studies during a pandemic. We did the, with the vaccines. Why did we not also do these large studies uh, for early treatment with uh, with some of these small molecules? I mean, just it just I, I, I think it's political. It's like Trump says hydroxychloroquine. All of a sudden, everyone in medicine decides uh, it's 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 obviously a bad thing to have early treatment with with small molecules. Why did they listen to him at all? Why did they care what he said at all? Why did it shouldn't matter at all? He's not a doctor. Yeah. He's not a doctor. Just, put, 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 move along. Let us figure it out. Such nonsense. It's almost unbelievable like, that, that 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 something like that could happen. But I think it did. I mean, I, I think the um, I think what should have happened when what should happen is the look. We as uh, physicians, as public health folks, we have to be able to talk to anybody. If people think of us as if we are uh, partisan, they're not going to trust us. Nor should they trust us. Like, I mean, if I, if you think I'm look, t looking down on you, why would you listen to me about anything? Right. That's right. I, I don't know. If you got this I was listening to Clubhouse yesterday with Dr. Fauci on it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It just popped up on my phone randomly. They know me, and um, he said that he's apolitical, and he was very worried about the, uh, you know, the way that the country is divided. And he he was he just made it very clear. He was like, I'm a scientist, I'm apolitical. Well, but yet he refused to take, uh, uh, he said no crowds unless you're demonstrating and then refused to address why that was a, I mean, it's okay, it's okay if he wants to take that position, but just say I'm suspending my, my uh, think, moratorium because I think these- uh, I think these, he just had to do that. Well, but yeah, I don't think he's that's, political. That's political. That's political. That's I important. know it's hard to be a medical Look, doctor. Look, I still, not have I still support politics. him fully. I do, and I think he would have gotten us through this better than probably anybody if he could have functioned normally. And you know, if things had been operating normally, I, I, I look to him all the way through the AIDS epidemic. Is the reason I got involved. A lot of things I got involved with. Oh, he had, he had some big fans there. Like he's, he's fine, but it's, I'm, it's not a great I job have, to have uh, during a pandemic. That's for sure. On my bookshelf, not not the one behind me, I have uh, Harrison's Internal Medicine. He's an editor. Mm -hmm. I mean, I learned a lot of medicine from him, mm -hmm. right? In some sense, but I have lost a lot of respect for him through this epidemic. Yeah, and it's the the double talk is what I don't like. You know, that, that and the blindness to the co the collateral damage. I, I just like I, I saw this one exchange with him, and I think it was Rand Paul in the Senate, where he mm -hmm. just he basically was asked about the collateral damage. He says, well, I, that's not what I'm paid to look at. I'm, I'm paid to think about Yeah, he does not. Well, because most of the collateral damage is mental health. And, and uh, although plenty of the screening issues and all this stuff, I, I bet you he weighed out the, the collateral damage on screening and, med and medical consequences, gave no regard to psych, no regard. He, he doesn't really get that. Um, all right, so so state that again. I got to let you go in a couple of minutes, but, but make that case again about the confusion of scientific norms versus public health norms. I, I want people to hear that articulated in one chunk. So the, the, the key thing is in science, we have to be able to debate uh, and it's a dialectical process. If I believe A and you believe B, well, we come to an agreement about an experiment and you know, it turns out, God forbid, you're right. Now I give up A and, and say, okay, B. Well, no, no, it's going to be B prime. And then we come up with another experiment and we can, and we just, it just keeps going. It's that's the fun of science. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not allowed to come up with B prime, science is dead. We mm -hmm. can't we just end it. And you don't, you end up with something closer to the truth as a result of that, that dialectical process working itself out. Um, the norm is disagreement. The norm is, uh, but also experiment and observation and, and, uh, and, 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 and eventually potentially consensus. Um, the norm in public health is uniformity of messaging. I say, you know, this is smoking is bad for you. We all say smoking is bad for you, so that the public can see that most people, most reasonable people, think smoking is bad for you. So you, so you can make good decisions about your own behavior. Applying the norms of public health, this uniformity of messaging, to the scientific process before it's had itself a, a time to work itself out, 
is absolutely a devastating bad thing. And we've done that during this epidemic. Yeah. So and the science wasn't there yet. And yet the public health behaved as though it was. Yeah. So like outdoor, like we keep seeing like basic things like, you know, is outdoor spread common? No, it's not common. And yet, uh, you know, like it, it finally a year later, the CDC acknowledges it um, is, 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 uh, you know, is, is, uh, uh, masking, uh, by yourself in a car useful <laughs> riding a bike or riding a bike. I mean, is, I, I, you know, six foot or three foot distancing is that which, which one's the right number? What if it's, if it's aerosolized, does either matter? Yeah. Um, right. I mean, I think there's like, there's like legitimate scientific issues here at play. Yeah. And instead of freezing it, your the, the scientific discussion. So where you, if you disagree, it's dangerous, uh, which would be the public health norm. We, 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 we've instead just frozen science. And now you're only like a few select people who write for the New York Times can speak out. I mean, right. it's just it's, it's ridiculous. And la last thing, why do you think our profession self-censored? Why do we suddenly go into this weird, I'm just unwilling to speak uh, uh, like, like a weird, uh, it was, I, I, it feels like some other period of history where there's like been some kind of, uh, you know, like during the Borgia era or something, you know, when there's cleanses, you know, <laughs> it's very weird. I mean, you, 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 you give a prescription to hydroxychloroquine, you may lose your job. Like if you, if you uh, disagree or I, I wrote something called the Great Barrington Declaration, arguing for a focus protection approach, Th tens of thousands of, of doctors and scientists signed it. Many have written to me saying that they lost their jobs or had their jobs threatened. Um, I think it's the misapplication of this norm over and over again, but the, the institutions that govern science and medicine wrapped itself around this idea that, that, that the authorities knew what they're doing. I, I was censored off on YouTube on a, for a video I did with the governor of Florida asking me essentially scientific questions. I mean, I may or maybe I may be right or maybe wrong, but the point is that the people of Florida should get to hear what this, what the, the governor is hearing in his own, so that what, in the decisions he makes, right? I mean, that's, yep. that's a democratic norm. Yep. Um, uh, but instead, it's every single contrary opinion is dangerous. Well, then that means we have to do something about the dangerous people. It's really that I think itself is dangerous. I, I don't know how that gets fixed very easily. How do you unring that? You're, you're, I think, yeah, I, I think that I think we'll finish there. But I think that is exactly the issue. Do something. I'm going to write this down about dangerous people. That is isn't that something? There's got to be other periods of history where people have had to do something about dangerous people. And I believe it was 1790 in France. I believe it was 1916 in Russia. I believe it was, uh, where else? There have been many, many examples of this. Uh, and so that's kind of crazy. Um, I don't think myself as harmless, but I guess I guess not so much. I, I, that you, you, I, I look at you as, as sort of enlightened and trying to get towards the truth. And that's what we should be doing in our jobs. But but I, I, I learned how much... The, um, how non-autonomous our peers are. They are parts of big systems. They have jobs now. And so they have to, you know, toe the line of the, of the employer. And that, that to me was a huge, huge shock in all this. It was interesting that the surgeons remained improvisational a little bit. They were doing things. They were just quietly just doing what they do. But the medical side froze in place and refused to do or say anything. And uh, even if they had feelings about it, they just shut up. That was very, very shocking. Very shocking. Well, listen, you got to go. I appreciate the time you did spend with me. I've taken you come back again a few more minutes than you. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure to meet you. Pleasure both. you as well. And uh, if we can help you and uh, have other things to discuss, please bring them here. Thank you. Take All care. right. Talk soon, Doctor J. Why don't we, Susan? Um, we'll take a break so you can air those uh, commercials, and I will come back and I'll strike back a little bit. How about that? Does that sound good, Susan? Sounds like a deal. I got it. I just found out the carpet's wet. The red carpet somehow got wet. Okay. And it's no good. N never good? So, yeah. We like, will never be any good? We can't use it. I have to throw away. Oh, my God. <laughs> somehow it got wet. I guess the sprinklers went into it or something. I don't know. I thought I had it all covered. But, c'est la vie. Okay. But, um, okay. So, we'll have a little. Uh, little break and be right back.
Anyone who's watched me over the years knows that I'm obsessed with Hydrolyte. Well, in that's... my opinion, the best oral rehydration product on the market. I literally use it every day. My family uses it. When I had COVID, I'm telling you, Hydrolyte contributed to my recovery, kept me hydrated. Now, with things finally reopening back around the country, the potential exposure to the common cold is always around. And like always, Hydrolyte has got your back. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity, my new favorite, starts with their fast-absorbing electrolytes and adds a host of great ingredients. Plus, each single-serving easy-pour drink mix contains 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, 300 milligrams of elderberry extract. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity comes in convenient, easy-to-pour sticks that rapidly dissolve in water, make a great-tasting drink, has 75% less sugar than your typical sports drink, uses all natural flavors, gluten-free, dairy-free, caffeine-free, non-GMO, and even vegan. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity is also now available in ready-to-drink bottles at the Walmart next to the pharmacy, or as always, you can find it by visiting hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. Again, that is H-Y-D-R-A-L-Y-T-E dot com slash D-R-D-R-E-W. Be sure to use the code Dr. Drew 25 for a special discount. Dr. Jay, it was a great interview. I appreciate him being here. Sorry, um, I'm to why don't you chat with everybody something. for a little bit while I go talk to this guy yeah, about the Go ahead. Right go right ahead. Back. I know Susan's busy right now. How are we going to do the after dark? Uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, I mean, at the after dark, the, uh, the strikes back. I beg your pardon. All right. So, uh, what do you guys think? Um, he's very interesting. Um, I, I, he's just a, you know, a peer that has some interesting ideas and he should be listened to. And he's a very smart guy. He's, he's, he's actually a statistician. Um, so interesting. Uh, Shane is asking how I'm feeling. I'm completely over COVID. I've been running regularly. I'm, I had still some weird neurological symptoms and I got over it by learning a language. I had a sense that if I worked hard on it, I don't know why I thought to do this, but uh, we're going to go travel soon and we're going to go to Greece. And I thought, I'm going to learn Greek. And uh, I've been doing that. And uh, it cleared up my fog instantly. And I'm learning Greek, so which is uh, pretty good, if very so. Uh, Scott Jurgens, Fauci is not a monster. Uh, I would disagree with that. Uh, Andrew Oshkazvili, um, anything, do we miss anything with uh, Dr. J that you were interested? He, I only had just limited time with him. We only had about 25 minutes or so. Uh, let's see, I asked you earlier. Uh, okay, Makai, what does she want to know? Okay, I asked you earlier whom you were rudely alleging was a conspiracy theorist and why, and you haven't responded. Um, okay, I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't know if you're talking to somebody else on the thread. Uh, be a little more clear. Uh, let's see. Dilo Cougar, thoughts on the media pushing the narrative that people didn't wear masks died. Uh, yeah, I don't know what to make of that. Uh, I, you know, that it's, it's again, that's the virtue signaling that uh, Dr. J was talking about. Um, okay. Uh, just intentionally misleads the public and is overly cautious. Uh, it's more esque. I think that's that's a fair assessment. That's a fair assessment. He is overly cautious, and he does sometimes mislead the public to to keep that caution a rolling. Uh, his original statements about masks made perfect sense at the time. We thought that we we were thinking this was going to be more like an influenza virus, uh, and it was uh, as such. You don't want your hands near your face with an influenza virus, and so mask could have made things worse, and we didn't know then. Uh, give us your thoughts on the lab leak and the gain of function. Uh, Mac uh, wait a minute. Dr. Drew, I addressed this comment to T.S., whom frequently trolls several people. Okay, my guy, thanks. Um, but uh, Martin says, give us your thoughts on the theory of lab leak and gain of function. There is an amazing article in Medium. It's the best journalistic, just the journalism. It's the best journalism I've seen in about five years. I, I really thought this kind of journalism was dead. It's, it's in Medium. Go to medium.com. I, I put it up on Locals. I put it up for everybody so you can see it there. It's called Origin of COVID Following the Clues. And it's about a 40-page article where he goes through all of the evidence, exactly how things transpired. He doesn't leave anything out. And he allows you to draw your own conclusion. And if you read that article, if indeed it is as accurate as it appears, you'll see it's obvious what has happened. It's, it's very, very obvious. Uh, what's what's sort of damning from my standpoint is not China or their attempt to hide it. That, that's just them being them. It's the fact that we took narratives from people that pushed the narrative before the science was there again. That's what Dr. J and I were just talking about. And that, become, that became axiom. That became just true. And in fact, they were pushing the pangolins and the bats before there was any evidence of that. 
That was staggering to me. And he goes through the whole history of how that happened. That was a, a startling thing to me. So, I mean, yeah, so something leaked out of a viral lab. Should we be that surprised? I, what, what, what I find, um, what I would like to know is not whether, I would like to know the way the Chinese government behaved in Wuhan in response to the leak. Let's just call it a leak because I don't know what it is or it isn't. But just, they'll, they'll probably cancel me for even saying those words. Yeah. Um, but, but let's say it's not a leak. Let's just say the way they behaved in the sort of lockdown and cleanup looked at though that as though that was an orchestrated phenomenon that they were like planning. So it makes me wonder if they, if they had a sort of a emergency plan for a leak. Now I'm not saying it was a leak, but if there was a leak, that's looked like a ready made, like they had a, a, a thing in place because it wasn't doctor driven. That was not something that the epidemiologist or the infectious disease doctors told the government to do. That's something the government did like that as though they already had a plan to do it. And then magically our government adopted that for no good reason. And we adopted it you know, very strange. We adopted it late and then it wasn't going to work. And it was just like everything wrong went wrong. So although another thing that I find curious, and you guys back me up on this, people are talking about how the U.S. botched it, botched it, botched it, botched it, which I understand. But we also kind of saved the world with us in Germany, the mRNA vaccines. We, we sort of saved the world. Uh, why isn't the U.S. getting a little bit of the U.S. healthcare system and the research systems that we sustain Getting a little bit of a credit for that, little bit. Uh, I, I isn't that. I, I mean, you can argue that AstraZeneca may have been adequate, or maybe the Chinese vaccine or the Russian vaccines are going to end up being useful. But if not, the only vaccines we know for sure are going to bring an end to this epidemic are U.S. or U.S. German vaccines that that, that save yeah, the world. Yeah, now they're sending all our ven ventilators to India. Too. Yeah, why? Because we probably have a lot of them now. Why doesn't why do, doesn't anybody? We need to send our vaccines. We don't to have to. India. Maybe we don't have to celebrate that, but at least acknowledge that. Help me on well, the stream here. Well, you can't here. give the Trump. Uh, well, forget Trump. Camp Just don't even breathe Trump. Just give it to you Biden. Can't. Give it to Biden. He rolled it out. He got millions well, of vaccines. It was already I, whatever. Rolled what, out. Whatever. It, it, that it. It was fast. Yeah. Why isn't the U.S. healthcare system and re and biomedical research um, programs of this country getting a thanks, at least a thank you? I, I don't. Un isn't that weird? Doesn't anybody else think that's weird? Help me. Do you think the Chinese are happy with us? <laughs> Well, they have their own little vaccine. Thing. We'll see if that works. <laughs> they don't want us to have it. Oh, yeah, Dilo Cougar. Interesting. We need to maintain the narrative. We have a bad healthcare system. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, people are dying, and the healthcare system sucks, but the but the science is good. You know, we're able to. I, I, look, somebody just told me to shut up. Okay. No, no. Somebody on periscope. Don't shut up. Don't shut up. How did? How is there a periscope? Well, it's it's periscope, but it's Twitter TV. It just isn't. It, they're still there. Okay. They still exist. Um, George Clark wants me to think thoughts on the latest testimony between Rand Paul and Fauci. I didn't see it. It sounded like Dr. J had seen it. I, I haven't seen it, so I don't even know. Uh, uh, uh. Louise says I'm right. <laughs> Louise says I'm right. Thanks, Tom Cigars. Tom Cigar is on the warp path today. Who hate, who's hating on uh, these jeans? I don't like the big pharma has done the research <sighs> on small molecules. Day. They did a super fantastic job. Okay, yeah, I, that's fair enough. If that's that's how you feel, that's fine. But you're giving a nod to the reality of what happened. Um, India makes vaccines. Why would we send them vaccines? Because we have an effective vaccine that's been proven effective. That's why. Um, is medication dangerous? Matt Reynolds, all medication are dangerous. Let's let's start with that. All medicines are dangerous. Here's the thing that I find. Tell, here's another. Oh, here's a strike back. I want to strike? Okay. He, those of you that have an issue with big pharma, I, I get the issue, but if I am a practicing physician, not a surgeon, and I have a disease I'm trying to treat, I'm going to use something called a medication, lots of medication to alter the physiology of a disease state to try to bring it back to a healthy state. You can't avoid that. And where medications come from, like I have hypertension, I have hypercholesterolemia, uh, I, you know, I, there are medicines I need to take, and those medicines were developed by a company. You may not like it. You may not like the behavior of some of the companies. I totally understand that. But this idea that doctors should not use medication, then you're not a doctor. You can be a surgeon, but we are either using a scalpel or we're using chemicals to alter physiology of disease states. Those are the two things that doctors do. And people 
get weird on the medication side. So, um, hmm, very strange to me. Now, look, if you're a young, healthy person without any diseases, you should not be taking medication. You should not be taking supplements even. You should just be being healthy. But as you age, aging becomes its own disease process, and you develop other syndromes and diseases that you'll pick up along the way. And the idea is to either cure or suppress the consequence of those conditions long enough that you can live a very long lifespan. Uh, something will get you anyway. Um, it will happen. Um, purple machine, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, natural medicine will do nothing for my prostate cancer. And I mean nothing. Uh, that's it. That's the way it goes. Uh, and that's, that's true. Now, maybe, and, and by the way, if you're using a natural substance that alters physiology sufficiently, it becomes a medication at that point. So whether you're, you know, exposed to Amanita phylloides and you have a f reaction and die, or whether you're licking tree what bark, is that? To, so it's a pain, it's a, it's a very, uh, deadly mushroom, or you're licking tree bark to get salicyclic <laughs> acid, you're still getting a chemical, which if you get in sufficient doses to change the physiology, will be a medication at that point. So it's a very strange thinking people have about these things. Uh, anybody? Uh, all right. I mean, I think young people can take supplements if they if it makes them feel better, especially if they, they I, There's no harm in most of the stuff, for sure. But, but they don't need to. You know what I mean? They, they shouldn't need to. If they're otherwise healthy and they're watching their diet and they're not smoking and they're not drinking and they're not doing drugs and stuff, you, know, you should... Should be, but you if know. you like a lot of fast food and you want to get some vitamins, uh, Shane, the genetic score does not yet uh, talk about the uh, T cell function. It does give some B cell memory analysis, um, but it's not quite clear yet what to do with the T cell information. So that's coming. That is coming. If you ask Tommy Chong, you should use that. Uh, I know. I was thinking about that when I said that. You're to, so funny. It's so funny you remember he, that. Did he? Well, yeah, I was on his podcast. What? Uh, what? Um, ever happened to him did he ever have to get treatment or did it actually uh work? I, I mean you don't not everyone with prostate cancer has to get treatment and by the way if you smoke in a pot you testosterone will fall estrogen will go up it might be a treatment for prostate cancer but then it's a medication right. it's a medication at that point if you're taking enough to suppress your testosterone and raise your estrogen you're changing physiology to address a disease that's what doctors do so do you want to talk about your prostate cancer yeah, so I've had a little recurrence of my prostate cancer in spite of having, having had prostatectomy 11 years ago. And so I need to have radiation in July, which is it's not that big a deal. It, it's, it's pretty common. Sometimes stuff can get into the pelvic region, the bones particularly there, and you give it some radiation, and it has a very high cure rate, very, very high. We're going to light him up. Yeah, so... So there you go. So that's I hope my it good. Comes out and well. it's one, it's one of the reasons I'm not contemplating running I know. for no governor. No big deal, uh, Tom. Right? It is right. no big deal. It's not a big deal. I mean, I'd rather not do it. I mean, I but I I met with the that I met with the team and talked about risks and benefits and stuff. And well, I, now you're I am hitting not that worried. age where radiation works better, right? Well, that's like, exactly right. Listen, I think my I dad. That. My dad had radiation as his primary treatment when he was like seventy. When he was like 71, 72, and it and it cured him. So that they they actually took that information when they were looking at my stuff and thought, oh, that's very predictive that I'll have a good response too. And I think your uncle did too, right? Or did he, he did, have the uh, He had a prostatectomy, I think. Uh -huh. I'm pretty sure. They, he may not have had. He was going to have, uh, and maybe not. Uh, Andrew, you keep repeating that uh, Las Vegas is open with no plexiglass. <laughs> he wants a Dr. Drew. Oh, party. that's a good idea. Did you know they were thinking somebody was su suggesting that? That's a good idea. We should do that. What? We should have a, like a, much the way Corolla has Corolla Cruz, we should have a, a Vegas, a, Vegas sell event. The, sell the Cosmo to everybody? Yeah, let's or have a Vegas Virgin. event. A, uh, Andrew, Virgin? good idea. Look at Andrew. That's a good idea. When, when, when Maybe later in the summer or early in the fall. Andrew's like our PR team and our booker. I know. He, well, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Lily. Um, Who needs Dr. to pay Drew a PR said, team? Wait, wait, wait. Scott Seiler. I said that people who question the COVID vaccine have OCD. I don't think I said that. I, I, if I did, I misspoke. No. Doesn't sound like me. Um, a Drew's Cruise, yeah. Maybe we could team up with Kroll. Eh. Nah. I, yeah, I'd rather, I think the it's Vegas idea is there. a very, very, very good one. I, I like that idea. <laughs> right? Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. And, and plus it's sort of central for people that can come from different parts of the country <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> no? If you don't like the idea? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Cruise would... I don't know. Let's get. Maybe. We do cruise with Drew's crew. <laughs> <laughs> Drew's. You have to join locals, though. 
okay. <laughs> to be on Drew's cruise. Uh, all right, listen, I I am I think I think today's show sort of stands on its own. I think I think we're about Drew's cruise. It can also be called Drew Screw. Did you know that? Use that mind for good. I keep telling you. <laughs> I keep telling you. Make sure it's used for good. <laughs> Somebody's going to tell me to shut up again. So, Kat Dunleavy, <laughs> after the pandemic, you say, um, when would that be? Like the fall. I think the fall is a good time yeah, for Yeah, it's this. too hot in the summer. Yeah, but, but I mean, we could go to that new Virgin Hotel that was the Hard Rock. I know. I wonder what the prices are like over there. Uh, you know, it be interesting. Or maybe we could team up with um, Jason Ellis with his whole crew. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Ooh, 57-year-old uh, Y57 cough and vomiting since J&J a month ago. Wow. That's weird. That is weird. Um, did they do a CAT scan, Ricky? They, they should do a CAT scan on her because um, the, the transverse sinus thrombosis can be sort of a, a very peculiar phenomenon. So make sure she gets a CAT scan. I, I um, know of another case where they got some optic nerve inflammation too. So if her vision is changing, make sure she's a neuro-ophthalmologist. Uh, all right. Thank you guys for being here. Susan, anything else? My um, carpet was like a moldy, shrunken sweatshirt. Oh. oh. Like a, a wool. I had this beautiful wool carpet. It sat out there for a couple of weeks. I put a car cover over it. Mm. Apparently, it got full of water. Mm. Of course. I don't know why I left it out there. So what what is that? But it, mean? You know, whatever. I It's easier to let go and it just smells like Does that like mean they're going to just stuff wool, everything back wet, in the room? Wool sweater. Or they're leaving wet everything? Dog. What, what does that mean to all the craziness that I'm seeing in here? What do you mean? All, all the furniture moved all over the place. Well, no, we had to. We're changing Paulina's room into Douglas's okay. room. I'm not anyways, sure that way. I'm going to move all the furniture anyway. So okay. I'm going to vacuum it. Okay. We'll hit it with the steamer and we'll okay. just live with okay. it I, I was going to try to save that fancy yes, carpet but it got screwed up all right it's okay it ate it oh yes yeah, she's having blurry vision ricky ricky ricardo um yeah get get a neuro ophthalmologist involved get a, get a cat scan do all those good things because this is this is where the j and j can go a little wonky uh all right guys thank you much for joining us today tomorrow uh we have somebody special too, right? Dr. Amy Barnhorst. Amy Barnhorst. We're talking a little gun violence. We're going to talk about acute psychiatric care, get some more mental health update on what's going on in the world. Oh, my goodness. Um, lots of good stuff. Uh, next week, um, correct, Susan, we should prepare people for this. Next week, we are gone all week, the whole week? Do you want to try to do Tuesday? Um, we might be able to. I'm, no, you have you have Gutfeld, and you have, unless you want to do it after Gutfeld. And no, I have Wendy Williams. Caleb can zoom you in or something, but I just think it might be a, a fly on Monday, fly on we'll Friday, be here Friday. We'll be Wednesday, here Thursday, the Teen Mom reunions. I'm everybody, set somebody up for Friday and also for Saturday. I might no, get no, I can't do Friday. I'm trying. I'm flying Friday. No, this Friday. Oh, this Friday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, also, um, we might get Stephen Adler in here on oh, Saturday. Oh, good. That'd be nice to see. And him. maybe also, I don't know. I, I think we should talk to Amber too about uh, about Tawny, Amber Smith. I think um, Stephen Adler is starting a new rehab, but he's calling it a sports club, so it doesn't sound like rehab. He's thinking Slash would be good, too. As a Slash would be good. Slash is great. Well, he <laughs> I don't know. We'll if see. the two of them want to come on. They're, they, they're well, they're, I don't know if Slash does, but uh, I know Stephen will. If he well, they were having a little problem for a long while there, the two of them. I'll reach out. They're gonna, he's going to be back on tour in July. Stephen is? Yeah. Great. I know. I think Good he's doing him. well. All right. Well, let's talk to Stephen Adler. We'll talk to uh, Amy Barnhorst. We will, uh, pro I guess it would be nice if we could do things Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And then next week, I think next week's going to be completely off, like the whole week. I don't, I don't see how we can possibly schedule anything unless yeah. it's. I, Drew I will upload on locals and he'll upload on I'll do some, Instagram uh, Live and he'll yeah. do a little, a little, he'll do his socials. He's going to New York. I'm staying here, and my daughter's coming into town, and then we have a wedding on the weekend. So yeah. we have a big week. Yeah, and it's then, gonna, and then we will be gone uh, from, what, June 10th until June? Whew. 10th to the 27th. We really won't start up again until the 28th, right? We'll, we'll try to pack them in before we leave, but, you know, we, the Pinsky's got to live a little. Yes. And, you know, you can catch up on the previous episodes. Well, we we are taking we're actually taking a vacation, which is if Drew, um, you know, if we can tap him in, he's just a busy man. He's got teen mom. You got to take care of teen moms. Stay at St. George. What is that? Where's that? I don't know. It's on our calendar. I don't know what that is. 
All right. Well, uh, we won't c- continue to keep you guys. We are. Uh, oh my God! Look at all these questions. Oh, oh let's see. Boring. Yeah. Thanks, Maximonics. <laughs> I, I am I'm not, I'm not surprised. I, I would say the same. Well, this is like. Uh, they, okay. Oh, all right. It. Somebody As, made a picture of two. It looks fingers. like oh penises. Two penises Great. touching. Well each done. Other. That's beautiful. That usually comes out of Twitch. Yes, it's a Twitch. Hi filth Twitch. Force. Hi Phil Force. How are you? Um, this is a definitely Su- a Susan. No, 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 no. We, we're going to get knocked off the whole. YouTube oh, come on. It's not we a real will. one. It's just a... I, we will get knocked off for those, I promise. You. No, we won't. Uh, yeah, we will. Um, but here's the deal. Um, somebody just asked uh, for us to do um, social lives, like uh, Instagram lives mm-hmm. and, uh, yeah, and you can do TikTok that. lives from Greece, which we will do that. Yeah. We will do so that. next, you can be creative and figure out ways to... But we'll be here on uh, tomorrow, and we'll be here Friday, and we'll be here Saturday. All right. Maybe we'll even Sunday. That'd be great. We'll Before see you then. Before you leave. So long. I have a little after dark silliness. Ooh, so here's what I saw on your face, okay. which is awesome. Okay. I saw first disgust. Okay. And then I thought, well, if I really like him, right? Right. Maybe it would be okay. Yeah, it's this game I play called Deal Breaker. Like, he's <laughs> perfect in every way. But he has just a little cornel, whatever. And <laughs> is it a deal breaker? <laughs> oh my god she was funny i've struggled with various digestive issues over the years so gut health is extremely important to me now while gut health awareness has increased it has led to a wellness trend that inspired a host of kind of questionable marketing claims and even false claims you've seen the word probiotic attached to all kinds of supplements drinks and more and they may claim to deliver the healthy microorganisms our guts need for proper function but all too often the promises are really too good to be true Thankfully, I became aware of a company called Seed and their flagship product, the Daily Symbiotic. That's right. Seed's Daily Symbiotic offers 24 clinically researched strains of microorganisms in a single dose. These strains support gut, skin, and heart health and promotes regularity, sometimes within as little as 24 to 48 hours. To me, what really sets Seed's Daily Symbiotic apart is its delivery system. This is my supply. While some products may offer the right strains, they are fragile and they rarely survive the trip through your gut. Seed uses a capsule in capsule design that helps ensure that 100% of the probiotics reach your colon where they matter most. Now, I've been taking Seed's Daily Symbiotic, and I encourage you to check out their story and the science behind what they do. To try it for yourself, just go to seed.com slash Dr. Drew. Use code Dr. Drew for 20% off your first month of Daily Symbiotic. That is seed.com slash Dr. Drew. Use code DRDRW Dr. Drew. I am so grateful for our friends at Blue Microphones. Not only have they completely changed what our show sounds like, they've given me headphones so I can monitor things better. This is the mic for millions of creative people, and now I know why. I'm so grateful for them completely changing the quality of our audio. You'll find Blue Mics like Yeti and the mouse, which we're using here, both in pro studios and home studios all literally all over the world. Their popular Yeti caster is a blue Yeti microphone plus a boom arm system that's behind many of your favorite podcasts. I see run into them all the time and now I know why. If you've ever thought about creating your own podcast or YouTube channel, Blue can make you sound and look great. Just visit bluemic.com and click get started and you can start telling your story.